The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. So I'll just now like to talk this morning uh, because this theme opens up, you know, how do we deal when people deal with the difficult situation when people we know pass away, whether they're very close or they're Dhamma friends, whoever they are, and how we can deal with that and what's, what is the Buddhist response to that. And so that's the focus I would like to have uh, for this morning. And first of all, I usually begin with the verse, but I'll begin with the Pali verse because I know so <laughs> Gary is teaching, is teaching Pali, actually learning Pali language, so it's good if I quote some Pali because the students will be few, maybe here, some watching at home, um, <laughs> live good. Uh, maybe that you will um, understand it, recognize it, and it's good to hear Pali because this is the, the language of the Buddhist text. And very interesting, they have sent an article recently that uh, one scholar is saying that the Buddha actually uh, used Pali when he was teaching, because it's very common for people to think he spoke in the Magadhyan language. Magadhyan is a kingdom, but he was actually not from that kingdom, so it's quite not impossible that he actually used Pali and that he standardized the teachings in Pali during his life. That was the suggestion, anyway. Interesting. So, Nabanje Papa ke mite, Nabanje Purisa Dhamme. Banje to mite kalyane, banje to purisutame sadhu sadhu. And that translates, I should ask Liv. <laughs> I should ask Liv, can we have a translation? <laughs> oh, I couldn't hear it, I couldn't hear it. Oh, I'll do it again. <laughs> so that translates from the English translates, do not associate with bad friends. Do not associate with low friends. Associate with spiritual friends. Associate with the best of friends. And this is, of course, recognizing that who we associate with has an effect on our mind. And you can see that, you know, in the time of the Buddha, the Buddha mentioned that you can see the company that the monks kept, the sorts of monks they were gravitated towards. So. You know, the ones that were interested in uh, doing um, austere practices, they were attracted to Mahakasapa. And the ones that were interested in um, remembering the teachings and uh, those qualities were attracted to Venerable Ananda. And he mentions a few of the other monks. And Venerable Sariputta, those that were attracted to him, were interested in developing wisdom. And then he mentions. <laughs> Uh, Venerable Devadatta, the monk who tried to, his cousin actually, who tried to kill him. And he said there are monks that attract, were attracted to him. So it's very much, as we say in English, birds are of a feather, fly together, <laughs> or come together. So this is very important that we choose our friends very wisely, you know, the people we are with, because they will influence us and we will influence them. And the, last night I was giving the, uh, we had a teens group, and it's so important for teenagers, much more than maybe for us, because we're, as teenagers we're very influenced by the people around us. And it brings me to one of the themes that I've been emphasizing during my visit, is that we have to look at the things we're taking into our minds, and that includes the, f the friends that we have, but also the things we take in from the internet, from news, from uh, all, all the different influences that we have and look at them and see whether they are enhancing our life, leading to more positive states of mind, more wholesome states of mind, to more happiness or not. And to really check up and then make a decision about whether we include that in our lives or whether we'll be better without that. So this is something I think uh, especially for the teenagers, because there's so much that emphasizes some of the negative qualities, you know. And I was talking to them last night uh, about hate. We're talking about the negative states of mind. Uh, last, the time before was greed, this time hate, and then delusion. And these are called the three negative roots of the human, uh, of, of people's minds, not only humans. 
And fortunately, there are three positive ones. And the Buddha being classically all-encompassing with his teaching, non-greed, non-hate, and non-delusion. So these, I was talking to them about these things. And so many things in, in our lives can actually accentuate greed. Greed's pretty easy to see. Accentuate uh, hate um, in all its manifestations. It's very important when we see that when the Buddha's talking about greed, hatred, and delusion, we might think, hang on, I'm not greedy, I'm not angry. You know, I'm, and I'm, I'm sure I know well, <laughs> well enough, <laughs> so I'm not deluded. But when the Buddha uses those terms, he means all shades of wanting in greed, you know, from the slightest, slightest movement of the mind, which is no longer happy, still within itself, peaceful within itself, that moves to something that can make me happy in the future. We call this um, tanha, or craving, or wanting. And the same with hatred. It's the movement of the mind to anything that's slightly negative and that encompasses all anger or hatred, fear, anxiety, many of these things. And delusion, and the biggie for all of us is this sense of who I am, this sense of self. And it makes the other two possible, actually. So these, these things are very important and they influence us uh, in our lives. And the friends we choose will either encourage those qualities or the negative qualities or the positive qualities. So for each of us, it's really a case that we have to look into our minds, see how we see whether something is leading to good states of mind, wholesome, positive states of mind or not. And then we can, if, if it's not, we can uh, try and reduce that or eliminate that from our lives if possible. And that's the, the wisdom of the Buddha is, Buddha is like a very practical, very experiential sort of thing. Uh, that we can apply in our daily life. So I was going to talk, as I mentioned uh, just briefly now, <laughs> about what we can do when someone passes away that we know. Someone close or someone we don't know so well. Many of you didn't know Malika, so for you, you know, you're just hearing about her now. But one of the big things that is very important is that we remember the person. This is actually something that uh, brings them to life for us. And those that are here, for instance, in this case with Malika, but we can do it with any, any person we know, particularly those we are close to. If we close our eyes for a moment, we can just bring them to mind. And we may even be able to hear them, you know, what they're saying, what they see, used to say to us. And so this act of remembering is so important. And when we remember, uh, they, as I say, they're still alive for us. And it's, it, it, uh, it's a way of honouring them in a sense, remembering them as a sort of honouring them, and hopefully, in a Buddhist context, not, not tying into when many people remember someone who's passed away, they get sad because they think they miss, they miss that person. But from a Buddhist context, when we remember someone who's passed away, someone close, maybe our mother, father, grandmother, grandfather, auntie or uncle, whoever it is, a friend. The thing we want to encourage is that sense of gratitude, a sense of thank you for the positive things you contributed to my life. So this is what we would feel, say for instance, with uh, Malika, you know, thank you Malika for your contribution to the Buddhist Society of Victoria, the contribution to Dhamma, to the contribution to the practice of your Dhamma friends too, by your example, and also the things you made possible for us. So a very important uh, aspect of our lives is gratitude. And the Buddha said there are two people that are rare in the world. Anybody know what two? Well, one of them you've got the idea already. <laughs> you know what the two two people who are rare in the world I think the first one's easy hopefully a grateful person <laughs> he said they're rare in the world but he said the second one who's rare in the world this person is somebody who does something without being asked you know they just do it spontaneously and so he said there are two persons that are very rare in the world. 
So this gratitude is not a quality that um, is encouraged very much. We, we often, the, the focus of most of our lives is on what we don't have, what we want, what we need. And this is not looking at what we already have, which is the obvious, isn't it? <laughs> and what we have is usually more than enough. But when the focus is always in on the things that are missing from our life, what we need to get, whether it be, you know, uh, material possessions, a new house, a phone, a new car, a new relationship, a new job, whatever it is, we forget what the positives that are already there in our lives. So this gratitude is, in a sense, free happiness. And uh, these days, these days, um, I know a friend of mine who's doing this, psychologists are really encouraging people to have these gratitude or th uh, gratitude journals. So they write down things that they're grateful for each day, you know, so, and hopefully they don't just put Monday, this, that, da, 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 and then next Tuesday, ditto, ditto, ditto. <laughs> Wednesday, ditto, ditto, ditto. <laughs> it's not working then. <laughs> because really, if you look at life, there's so much to be grateful for. And we can encourage a grateful state of mind. And I always mention, uh, one of the people who comes here, and this is like a teaching, isn't it really, from her that I, I, I took on board. She said, because she's from Sri Lanka, and I, I, I think people who are from Sri Lanka can appreciate this even more, so she said, when I turn the tap on in the morning and water comes out, I am so grateful and thankful <laughs> there's water coming out of the tap, you know. And uh, if you lived in Sri Lanka and other countries too, this is not always the case, not always the case. So. What makes us thankful, what makes us gra grateful, is when we lose it, when we don't have it. So this is actually, it's nice to be grateful and thankful while somebody's alive, you know, to have that feedback to them, you know, thank you for, you know, your kindness, thank you for supporting my life, helping me, and being an example, whatever it is. And of course this is, ties into Ajahn Brahm's uh, um, teaching about uh, when somebody passes away, that we, we, we focus on what there is to celebrate, the life that they had, what they shared with us, rather than feeling sad. So he always mentions his father who passed away in his 40s. His father was in his 40s. Ajahn, Ajahn Brahm was, I think, 16 or something. And he said he didn't feel sad at all because his father had lived such a good life. And, and therefore, when he passed away, he didn't have that sadness because he focused on all the gifts that his father had given him, including the famous uh, title of his book. You know that book? Opening the Door of Your Heart. So his, his father, that was one of his father's teachings. But it was more, he said, the door of my home is open to you when, when, where, uh, whenever and whatever you do. You know, sort of unconditional. So this is like metta. So when somebody passes away, it's very traditional to also to make, um, to offer a gift of good karma, all the goodness that we've done in their memory. And this is actually the best memorial to a person. And we can, it can be an ongoing memorial, I say to people. You know, particularly if they're feeling sad, they're missing the person, then they can do something or remember something they've done that's very good, very positive and dedicate it to that person. They dedicate this, this good act to the memory of Malika or whoever it is. So this is something we can do. And it's a very, the Buddha said in some cases, some beings in, we call samsara, uh, some of the ghost beings, they can actually only, they rely on the gifts that are given here for them to receive it in their new life as a ghost. Um, but most other beings, that's not the case. But sometimes people say to me, well, if the good karma I do, you know, I bring food to the monks and the nuns or offer, offer things or do other good things in my life, how do I know it's actually going to reach my relative? It's like Australia Post, isn't it really? <laughs> how do I know they're going to get it? And it's the the the... The under, what I get from that, the message behind that is, well, well, if they don't get it, is it worthwhile doing it? You know, why bother? You know, and uh, of course we can't know if they're going to get that gift 
that, uh, the happiness of seeing that we've done something in their memory. We don't know that. But what we do know is that we get the benefit first <laughs> because we've done something good. We get the benefit in terms of being, feeling happy about ourselves and of course creating this seed in the mind that will either ripen in this life or future lives. Because the Buddha said our actions, the body, speech and mind, they will have results of the same nature. And so the same nature, whether good ones will lead to positive ones in future and negative ones will lead to negative results in future. So we don't know whether they will get the gift, whether Australia Post will deliver it, but <laughs> we will get the gift. So I think this is one of the great benefits of remembering somebody and offering uh, merit, we call it, in uh, Punya in Pali, for the Pali people here, or Pin in Sinhala. This is one of the great things that we get the benefit from it. Also, I say, if the person who's passed away, if Malika could be aware of what we're doing here, she'd be very happy to see, well, one, we're remembering her, and two, we're doing something good in her name. We're talking, uh, we're talking about the Buddha's teaching, there will be offering of food, and next door we will do, maybe we can do the pouring of water, we can do a pouring of water, which is a traditional way of pouring the goodness, the merit, uh, giving it to that person. You know, they won't actually receive it, but they will feel happy. And if they feel happy, that mind state can lead to a better rebirth. I always say to people, too, when we're making merit for the, for the deceased, you know, with their family, friends, we hope they don't need it. And I say that's, that is uh, quite possible. If a person has lived well, then one can very logically, rationally, um, think that what comes after will be of a similar nature, that they'll go to a good destination. So someone like Malika, I, I think, will go to a very good rebirth, hopefully a heavenly one, so she can get a break from <laughs> a painful human body. <laughs> so we hope that they don't need it. But I say to people, even it's a bit like when we receive birthday presents, you know, somebody, we haven't expected them to remember our birthday and they come and they offer us something, we have it already. But we don't need it, but we're very happy that they remember it. They, they actually remembered our birthday or a special occasion. I know it's my birthday today <laughs> and people remembered. It's good to be reminded. <laughs> So this is, a, this is a, the part of the function of, of a, when we remember people, when we have these um, death anniversaries, is to you know, share that, that goodness with the deceased, you know, that they may you know, the, dedicate that goodness to them. And as I say, it's a far, far better <coughs> memorial, a far, far better thing to do than say a tombstone in a, in a cemetery. You know, not many people will visit it and, uh, you know, put flowers and things like that. But we can visit those that have passed away whenever we need to, whenever we want to. And uh, make the offering, this dedication of the goodness that we've done in our lives. So this is a far, far more meaningful, living memorial for, for us to offer to, to others. And in the process, we benefit, we become better people and they will be pleased to see that we're going in a good direction. I often think some of these deceased relatives, father and mother particularly, maybe grandfather and grandmother or auntie and uncle, they, they sometimes probably, if they can be aware of what their, their uh, relatives are doing, they may be very unhappy <laughs> because they see some of the negative things. But if they see the positive things, I'm sure, if they can be aware, then they'd be very, very pleased. But one of the things, uh, this, uh, you know, sharing of merit, we say sharing, but I prefer dedicating because really it's not like a transfer of, of something, you know, like in a bank account you can transfer to, you can transfer it from one account to another account, that sort of idea. And of course merit isn't really like that. It's an individual thing, something we make. Positive karma or negative karma is an individual thing. But 
what we can do, and this is the usual, how we usually uh, explain it, what, when we do good things, if the person who has passed away can be aware of that, it can bring that happiness to their mind and they can be reborn in a better situation, if they're in a bad situation or a difficult situation in terms of rebirth. But the other thing that uh, when we do these things in memory of somebody, and as I say, you can do it any day. You don't have to come to a temple or, or something like that. You can help somebody on the street who has no food and then you can remember your mother you know, and dedicate it, say it's mother or father, whoever it is, and dedicate it to them in, their mi in your mind. You can say, this is for, for my mother, this is for my father. And that way, you know, we bring a lot of, um, uh, we could say, consolation to ourselves. We feel better for ourselves and we help somebody else as well. So we can do many of these kind acts in our daily life. Just being kind to people, the way we speak to them, smile and things like this can be very, very useful. But the other aspect of making good karma, as I mentioned before, is that we're the first ones to benefit. We help ourselves by, by um, uh, making good karma. And also more than that, we can have the feeling, I can do something. I can do something for the person who's passed away. Because many, in many um, traditions, spiritual traditions, there isn't that sort of feeling that, that you can help. And so the grieving can be enormous because it's like a, a permanent, you know, parting, you know. Though most of these traditions, you know, you'll either go to heaven or hell, you know, but it's not sure. Maybe he goes to heaven, you go to hell. <laughs> so you're not sure. So there's always this sort of fear that's associated with it. But we help ourselves by being able to feel like we can do something. Other people, maybe in other traditions, may feel very hopeless, helpless, sorry, not hopeless, helpless uh, when it comes to dealing with uh, people, uh, their friends, their family who have passed away. So it also, what the way it helps us too, and this is really, I call it the gift, Malika, the person who's passed away in your life, whether family or friends, is giving to us. They give us the gift, as I mentioned today, of wisdom. You know, they're reminding us what life is about. It, that is, it isn't, this isn't a, um, that nothing lasts. It's not permanent, our lives. That all the things that come into existence, whether they be beings, human beings, animals, whatever, even planets, even the earth, all impermanent. One day they will pass away. And I like in, in Thailand, if, I'm sure in Thailand it has a different feeling to it. They have evidently all these uh, talks they start, you know, uh, formal talks in Thailand. These are uh, Dhamma Desam, as we call them, or Dhamma teachings. And they start with, we are all brothers and sisters in old age, sickness and death. <laughs> I think in Thailand that's probably, you know, people, people don't notice that. But it's a very true statement, actually, that these things are universal. Even though we feel them personally, even though we, we think of it as, as our personal tragedy, we've lost our partner, or we've lost uh, our mother, whoever it is, it really is a universal phenomena. And many of you will know the story of Kisa Gotami. Do you know the story of Kisa Gotami? Do you remember? I think you will when you start to hear it, actually. Kisa Gotami was a woman at the time of the Buddha, and she, uh, she had, a, I think, a son, actually, a child anyway. And this child was just a baby, and it died. But she had a very severe case of denial. <laughs> and she said, no, it's not dead. It's just sick. <laughs> and so she went to around the village that she lived in and probably traveled even further, to seeking doctors who could... Um, help her baby, help her baby. And I don't know whether they said to her, look, madam, this child is, is not sick, it's dead. It actually reminds me of a Monty Python sketch <laughs> about this parrot is deceased. <laughs> but anyway, I'm sure they, d they weren't that unkind to her. There's a funny the comedy skit many years ago, dates me rather, uh, of Monty Python where somebody's trying to sell a parrot in a, in a pet shop 
And this person comes in, it's John Cleese, he comes in and he says, he wants a parrot. And, oh no, he's selling them. And anyway, he comes in and he wants this parrot. And the shop owner is trying to sell him this dead parrot that is nailed to the perch. He said, this parrot is deceased. It is no longer. And they go on like this. Of course, absolutely dead. But of course, uh, nobody, maybe at the time of Kisa Gotami, people didn't uh, say those sorts of things. <coughs> Look, Kisa Gotami, the baby's dead. Anyway, she didn't accept it. She thought they'd got it wrong. And in them, in, 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 uh, eventually, eventually, that's the word, they perhaps out of uh, t uh, frustration and uh, exasperation, they said, well, why don't you go and see the Buddha? I'm sure he can help you. <laughs> and thinking, you know, well, at least she won't be bothering us. <laughs> and um, so she went to the Buddha and the Buddha said, yes, yes, I can help you with your, your sick child. And she said, he said to her, well, you know, if you go into the village, just bring me two mustard seeds, I think it was only two, from any house in the village. And she said, oh, fine, that's really easy. I wish I'd come to you first. And, but, and she's just going to head off to get these two mustard seeds. He says, but it must be from a house where nobody has died. Nobody in the family, none of the friends of the living in that house have died. So she goes to the first house and of course she's overjoyed. They, they, she asks them if you've got two, two mustard seeds. And of course they use mustard, mustard seeds quite a lot, making oil and cooking and so forth. They say, no problem, here they are. And she's just about to head off and they say, and she says, oh, has anybody died here? Oh, uncle died last week, you know. And she goes to house, house after house in the village. And every house, it was the same, someone had died. Maybe she could have hit on a house that was just newly built. <laughs> that might have been the way around it, actually. But in the story, it doesn't happen like that. And of course, after she's been through a number of houses, we don't know how many, she realised it's universal. You know, everyone has lost somebody. All these families are, have grief, in, have had the experience of losing someone that's close and dear to them. And then she was able to go back to the Buddha and... Uh, bow down and presumably put the baby down for a change and uh, and then say, I've realised that, you know, this is something in human experience. And the Buddha gave her a talk on Anicca, impermanence. And I think at that talk, when he talked about the the uni universal characteristic, we call it, tilakana, it's one of the tilakanas, that nothing lasts, that's come together, things that have come together must break down. It's incredibly logical, isn't it, really? Very compelling. But when he taught it to her, obviously, you know, for her to hear that, he had this, uh, would have to have had this incredible metta, this loving kindness, because he could feel, you know, compassion, feel her situation. And he taught her about Anicca. She heard it, and I gather, I think as I remember, she became a stream enter, attained the first stage of enlightenment. So that is... Uh, Kisa go to me, and that's one of the t things that we get from um, the teaching we're getting from when somebody passes away, who we know or who we're close to. And I'll just finish off because it's now time to finish off, but I'll just brief briefly mention at these times too, and this is particularly true soon after someone passes away, it's very important that we have closure, we call it these days, we use these terms closure. <laughs> And so we deal with the unfinished business because life is always a bit messy <laughs> and there are things that we don't, that have upset us that, we've, that uh, the other person has done, the person who's passed away and we bring them to mind and uh, first of all we ask forgiveness from them, you know, for the things we did which upset them because undoubtedly we have through our speech, what we've said, what we've done. And then we give our forgiveness to them as well. We give, forgive them for the things that they did or said which upset us so that we can let it go because forgiveness is like emptying. I use this simile quite, uh, quite a lot. It's like mental hygiene, but it's also like emptying the, metal, emptying the mental rubbish bin that we have, letting go of these things and, uh, and thereby moving on and uh, not harbouring that uh, negative thought in our minds. Because whatever we keep in mind, we experience it. 
So if there's any negativity, grudges in there, that's going to go around our mind. <laughs> we have to live with the rubbish. So if we can, as I often say, put the wheelie bin out on the verge, the, 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 the emotional wheelie bin of these grudges and resentments that we've accumulated. And as I mentioned, she's given us all these gifts as well, reminding us that life is short. And one of the things I liked from my arms round down the road, I go to the shopping centre near, a shopping, it's not centre, there are shops, shopping area with all these sh cafes and bread shops and whatnot. And one of the cafes has a, a Dhamma sign, has a Dhamma sign that says, life is too short. Good. Start with dessert first. <laughs> Isn't that probably not good if you've got diabetes, but nevertheless. And the last thing to to really to remember, and this is to fare well in our minds those that have passed away. And this is for Malika Malika too, whether it's family or friends, to fare to fare well them. And as Adrian mentioned, <laughs> who was here that, uh, you know, wishing them well for their journey, wherever that's taking them. And, as I say, wishing that they have this gift of good karma that we, have, we are uh, creating today, uh, whenever we create it, the many opportunities we have, uh, and saying to them, this gift of, kar of good karma is for you, wherever you may go. May you be safe, peaceful and happy. And may you encounter the Dhamma in your future life. And most important one, thank you, thank you to that person. So that's the talk for today. So, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So I'd like to finish there and if there are any comments, questions or complaints. I don't think you get your money back actually. <laughs> There's no money involved. <laughs> That's what they usually say, money back guarantee. Oh John, question from Germany. Oh, Germany, yes. yes. Can impermanent, impermanence also be seen as transformation? It sounds less grim and entails new creation. Would that transformation then not mm. be something that is not impermanent? Ah, right. Yes, um, a Nietzsche allows for the for and change. Viparinama Dhamma, we call it. Both of those are about change and uh, impermanence. Uh, there are there are conditions of of uh, our experience, and so if things were not impermanent, you know, for instance, we couldn't breathe in and out. <laughs> it, that's that's an impermanent function, actually. So life as we know it couldn't exist. So impermanence has its positive side in a sense and has its positive sides as the person from Germany is saying in the fact that we can change, we can transform and that's what you see often with Dhamma, don't you? For instance, the famous story of the serial killer at the time of the Buddha, Angulimala. I mean, you know, if, if he's permanently a serial killer, that's serious. <laughs> Well, how can you have, uh, you couldn't kill anybody actually if everything was permanent, could you? <laughs> but anyway, he transformed, you know, he was able to transform, to change. And he became an arahant and uh, finished with being born again. Which is fortunate because someone who had done, killed, they say, 999 people, their next rebirth would not be a good uh, outcome, I don't think, at all. So it is part of, transfer, transformation is part of a Nietzsche and it also means, doesn't it, we have the possibility to become enlightened like Angulimala, the, the possibility of removing all the negative aspects, the negative uh, three roots that I mentioned early in the talk, greed, hatred and delusion, completely, absolutely. And developing, and developing all the positive roots, non-greed, non-hatred, and of course the biggie, non-delusion. This is the wisdom that sees the Four Noble Truths, sees the essence of, of our lives and uh, not only transforms, transcends, <laughs> goes beyond this human existence of which is unsatisfactory, uh, which is impermanent and we say not self. So yes, that is very true that 
impermanence, there is a positive side to it that things will change. And you, you know, for instance, when we have, uh, when we're depressed, you know, that feels like it'll go on forever, doesn't it? But we have the wisdom of that says, uh, if we remember it, <laughs> this too will pass. This too will pass. Now, it used to be my, one of my mother's favourite uh, favourite uh, uh, quotes, and she used to listen to a tape by Ajahn Jagra over and over again, which he gave this talk called "This Too Will Pass." So, this is the positive side of anicca. It's the essence of of our experience as human beings, and um, all beings actually. So, so I hope that that's very true. It's, it is uh, it enables transformation, but it enables more importantly transcendence. That we can go beyond this realm of samsara. We can go beyond impermanence and dukkha and satisfactoriness and uh, not non-self. One never goes beyond that. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. And the second question from Canada. Canada. How, wow. Sorry. How does one help relatives who are suffering due to wrong views attached to the body? They have a strong distaste for Buddhism mm. due to their Christian beliefs. Mm. And a happy birthday, he said. Oh, thank you. Thank you from Canada. I have a friend in Canada near Vancouver. So, and how do this is difficult because, you know, uh, we have right view and wrong view in, in, in Buddhism, you know, and uh, for other religions, you know, there, there are some things we share in common that we would consider were right view, but there are some things we don't. But also sometimes the labels get in the way. So I think for the person in Canada, you know, just to share with that with the relative that, uh, you know, who's... Uh, Suffering with uh, it sounds like sickness. It sounds like sickness. Um, that to have that kindness and that caring, and not you know, it's not a time for intellectual debates or that sort of thing on the on the um, thinking level, but to have that connection um, in terms of feeling you know compassion, kindness. These things are examples, and they make the biggest impact. The words we say. Often, often don't, <laughs> and they may not. It's interesting when we when we talk, you know, we have different views and opinions. We can be coming from a negative, very negative uh, place, and that comes across actually. But if we come from uh, just as human being to human being, supporting that person uh, as best we can, and you know, obviously, for all of us, if we can get a sense that this body that we take so much to be us and ours, is not really ours, then you might say, well, whose is it? <laughs> if it's not ours, whose is it? And, uh, the answer, of course, is it's nature's. It always has been nature's. But as you get older, it becomes much, much more obvious because it doesn't do what you want it to do. The body no longer can. And I'm finding that, and I'm sure uh, many older people find that. So then that teaching that I mentioned, that the body would be saying to us over and over again, you don't own me, you don't own me, <laughs> you don't own me. And that, that actually can make for a lot, of, a lot less suffering in our life when we realise that actually. We make for a lot less suffering. We don't have to take it personally. And then the body doesn't have to be such a reflection of who I am. So very much in our society, people, you know, suffer so much because of their looks, because of the body, you know, because this is who I am, you know. I've got to have this colour hair or I've got to look like this, this tattoo or whatever it is, you know, that we take as to be ourselves. So we actually, in actual fact, when we really, and everybody knows this actually, we don't own the body, they really do know that, but uh, at a deeper level. But when we do take that on board, it can give a lot more peace, a lot more happiness, a lot more acceptance in our lives. Because the Buddha said in the end we cannot control the body. We have limited control over it, but we cannot stop it from getting older, from time to time getting sick, and certainly can't stop it from dying eventually. And so this is, you know, why there's a lot of fear too, of course, is often that people think, you know, if you are the body, when you die, finished. And that can be a very 
um, disturbing thought for people. Whereas in Buddhism we have the idea, no, not finished. The story continues. <laughs> It'll be another chapter. And uh, it will probably be fairly similar to in, in relationship to the life we've led before. And we may in fact actually meet, this is another thing, we may in fact actually meet those that are, we're close to, that are dear in our lives. Because the driving mechanism for rebirth is our desires. You know, we call it tanha, craving, upadana, clinging. Because of that, we will tend to be reborn in the places that we like, with the people we like. But there's always conditions, aren't there? Conditions apply. If we have the right karma for being reborn in that, as a human being or wherever we wish to be reborn, we have to have that as a support. But so very much, uh, we may meet again. We may meet again, quite likely, actually, in samsara. So I'd like to finish there. I think that's, is that the... Second question? That's yeah, good, good. So I hope that was okay for Canada. It's a difficult one, but in the end, if you are kind to your, your relative, you're compassionate, being a real human being, positive human being, then that will, that will be the best you can do for your relative. So those who would like to, we can pay respects and thanks to the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha. <coughs>